Thank you for listening to A Glimpse of the Kingdom. A Glimpse of the Kingdom can remain free because of generous donors like you. If you'd like to donate, feel free to do so online, or you can send payments through Facebook Messenger. Don't forget to tell your friends about it so that they can enjoy this ministry as well. Be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any podcasts. You can listen to my daddy every single day, like in the gym, in the car, or just at home. Glimpse of the Kingdom is awesome! Thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving us the chance in this air-conditioned room, my sisters and brothers in Christ, and those who watch online, those who listen to the podcast, to do an incredible thing, to think clearly about one of our sacred gospels. So please, Holy Spirit, give us your insight, your wisdom to understand it, and of course, ultimately, to apply whatever it is you tell us to apply in our lives. Lord Jesus, I confess, you know my heart. (laughs) Some of this will be just for historical, antiquarian values, but others will be theological motivated. No matter what it is we cover, no matter what we discuss, I'm asking if you would help it shape us into your image, that this document would come alive and come alive in us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 So if you look look in your New Testament, what does it say at the top? Does it say something like the gospel according to Mark? Yes. The gospel according to It might have something different from that. Okay, that is not in Mark. That's not Mark 1.1. 1, 1. That's the title to this work. The title of the work, as far as we can tell, did not arise for a long time after it was composed. So when the gospel first traveled around, it was, to some degree, you might say, anonymous. Now, It's debated in scholarship whether it was written to be anonymous or it was just anonymous because there's just no title written to it, uh, given to it. And I'll I'll talk a lot more about that in a moment. I'm first pointing out the fact in your English translations, the reason why it says the gospel according to Mark is because the editors of that Bible translation decided to put that. Yours just says Mark, doesn't it? What does it say? Mark. See, that's not like that's satanic and this is Jesus. You're right. It's just because the editors of that Bible just don't put Mark. Some put the gospel according to. But in Greek, uh, in the earliest manuscripts, there is nothing there. And what eventually got put there was katamakon. Katamakon. And that means in Greek, basically, according to. According to Mark. In Greek. Now, what? what's interesting about according to Mark is is that's what they also did with the other Gospels, Matthew, Luke, and John. And there are three that we call synoptics because they're so similar. Which are three of those? Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Those Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very similar. Very similar. In fact, about 93 to 95% of Mark is inside Matthew. And about 80 and is a Luke. John's a different bird. But nevertheless, all of them, it's according to Kata Makan, Kata Mathian, Matthew, Kata Lukan for Luke, Kata Hionan for John. According, what's, what's according to? It's like we're missing something. And what would happen when the day is gospel according to. But literally the manuscripts just started saying according to Mark, according to Matthew. That's the title of the whole work. But that comes later on. So I'm, I'm, I'm doing this to help you understand when you read your English translations, your editors of that Bible uh, have made decisions all the time. It looks like most of y'all have Bibles here, like the normal English translation, if you have one, that also has subheadings. So you might have a little subheading right above verse 1. I have one. Um, the one I'll use here the most is, uh, is Greek on one side and English on the other. So I go back and forth. On my English side is the RSV, the preaching of John the Baptist in italics. Did you ever say something like that? The the proclamation. That's, that is not in the manuscripts. It's not in Mark. That's the people who printed that Bible, so you'd buy it. They made up a subtitle, made up a subheading. I say that because most people don't realize that. They think it's in the Bible, but it's not. The editors did that. Secondly, it can sometimes be very, very typically, I think, very helpful to go, oh, that's that section. But it can be misleading if you think that is Bible. 
And you go, no, 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 this Bible's clearly about because the subheading says it. Just ask the editors who said that. God bless them. Okay? Um, little footnote, John Nelson Darby, who was a big advocate for dispensationalism and rapture theology, if you have my Revelation course, this sounds to sound a little familiar. When Schofield developed the, Thomas, uh, the Schofield Chain Reference Bible, he put in subtitles the rapture. Jesus speaks of his rapture. Or well, rapture was Darby's term, not Jesus' term, and not the Bible's term. But since that was in their mind, it's in my study Bible, that's in my Bible. That's what my Bible says, rapture. So it can be misleading. And so what we're going to do here as best we can is not pay too much attention to your subheadings, but what the text actually says. Okay. A couple quick things. If there is one, um, if you're new to my studies, understand, please, um, I will often mention scholarship and scholars and so forth. That's just because it's more of my guild, my training. It's not some ego thing. I couldn't PhD in five dollars get you a coffee at Starbucks. I mean, so that, so it's not like an ego issue. I'm saying it in case you care. Um, uh, my specialty when I was a New Testament PhD student was Mark. It was Gospels, Mark particularly, and so I studied the most of all the Gospels. Uh, the one I find the most, the commentary I find most readable is this one here. And it was actually my professor, which I went to Baylor, in fact, because she was a marketing specialist. It's by Sharon Dowd, D-O-W-D, D-O-W-D, and it's Reading Mark. This whole series is called the Reading, the whole commentary series, Reading Mark, Reading Matthew, Reading Romans, Reading Luke, Reading, it, the great series. Matthew is outstanding. It's by David Garland, but Mark is outstanding too. So Sharon Dowd, Dr. Sharon Dowd, you don't have to get this. It's just for reading pleasure. Some of you might love to do that and kind of read along. Uh, on your own. People just always asking David if there's one commentary. It is succinct. She's very concise and she's very clear. Uh, since it's so thin, of course it's not exhaustive, but her insights are very good. And uh, the reading Matthew is my favorite Matthew easy to read commentary uh, by David Garland. And it's, it's awesome. So if you want more commentaries, you're going to get more in depth, do your own research or come to me. I've got a shelf at you know, my office here full of them. I can lend them out to you or I can um, recommend books. It's up to you, okay? So I'm not requiring this. You don't need to bring this. I'm never going to say, turn to page seven of the, I won't do that. Um, we'll get that out of the way. Any questions about commentary so far? Okay, so in your handout, you should have a staple. The front page should say outline. Turn over to page two, because I'm going to go there in just a moment. Historically in the church, for a long, 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 long time, church tradition said that Matthew was written first. Matthew. And then, eventually, Mark won the day. And the reason why Matthew was written first, they thought it was written first, probably is because it was linked so closely to the disciple Matthew. And frankly, it was more popular in the early church. It was used more often. It had one of the model prayer versions, Our Father, Heart in Heaven. Um, and the ending, Thine the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever, he never said that. Well, at least we don't have evidence. So that's actually not in the model prayer, but... Matthew was very popular, very common. They liked that model prayer version uh, in Matthew 11. Uh, but anyway, for a long time, the church tradition said it was, and Mark was treated like some little, eh. They just didn't think highly of Mark because it was shorter. They cut out the Sermon on the Mount. A lot of the big teaching materials, not Mark. And so Mark was kind of poo-pooed on. They didn't like it for a long time. Well, a couple hundred years ago, scholars said, wait a second. Um, let's study this more closely, and they realize that almost certainly Mark was written first. Today, to spare you time, today most New Testament specialists in the world think what we'll call, what we'll call Markan priority. And so most New Testament scholars, and I'm one of them who thinks it's not Matthew and Mark, it's Mark, then Matthew used Mark, and then Luke probably used both Matthew and Mark, um, or maybe just Matthew who used Mark. And then John's out here as an odd bird. But basically, if you do the synoptics, Mark, Matthew, and Luke. Most New Testament scholars think that. And most New Testament scholars put Mark composed. I'm, I'm, I'm giving you a lot of this, just the Cliff's notes. If you want more reasons why, I'd be happy to tell you more. You just stop me. Most New Testament scholars think Mark was around, written around AD 70. Around, around let's, say, let's say 68 to 70. A.D. It was probably composed then. Now the major reason why, and there's a few reasons, but the major reason why most New Testament scholars think it was written around this, which is around 30 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. 
Jesus died probably on April 15th, AD 33. So you do the math, right? We're not talking about in just like over 50 years after an entire, probably a life of him was composed. Which means it's probably the earliest narrative about the life of Jesus ever composed. Okay, I'm going to say that first. Secondly, most scholars think it was written at this time period because of Mark 13. In Mark 13, we have this uh, apocalyptic section where Jesus is with his disciples. Remember, they have what's usually called the Last Supper. That's not what he calls it. But anyway, they have this Passover meal that he redefines. They go up to the Mount of Olives, go down the hill, come back up. And they're looking over, probably a little buzzed because they had a lot of wine at the Passover meal. Lasts about three hours. And they're going, man, look at this stuff. And Jesus says, see those great stones? Not one stone's going to be left upon another. Which I always like citing that when the church building has all the stones there because they're a lot bigger. But the stones are about as big as this wall. You can go there right now, and they're about uh, 2,000 tons each. I mean, they're massive stones that are left over. They're still there. And the temple was under construction at the time of Jesus. Well, he says, not one stone will be left upon another, which means they'll be destroyed. And the disciples, when is this going to happen? Well, then Jesus never answers the question. <laughs> But he gives them two answers. One is that temple is going to fall, and that's not the end of the end times. That's not the sign of the end times. That's different. Well, because Jesus predicted the destruction of the temple, which actually happened in A.D. 70, it did absolutely happen. Emperor Vespasian started it. Titus finished it. Uh, it's when the Jews wrought up real warfare, and they came in and did what they always do as Romans. They smashed, they smashed the opposition. And to punish them, they literally destroyed the temple, raised it to the ground, burned Jerusalem to a crisp, salted all their farms, outlawed circumcision, outlawed the reading of the Torah, renamed Jerusalem, Capilina Agotona. And so they cast all the Jews out. So it was a big deal. They weren't cast out forever, but for a long time. Since that is predicted in Mark 13, forever, scholars have said, well, Jesus could have predicted it, which means Mark must have been written right after the fact. Right away, you might be asked the question, how do you know Jesus could not have predicted that? If not, I'm asking that question for you. Well, therein lies the rub. That's one of the reasons why I don't find this date convincing at all. Um, what Christians have historically done is say, what do you mean? Jesus can predict that. He's Jesus. He's the God-man. Of course he can predict it. That's one route a lot most Christians take, which is fine. In scholarship, they don't care about churchy answers, and so they're all skeptical about everything, and they would say, good for you, Christian, and pat you on the head. Good for you. You can believe that. And you can. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. The other route a lot of historians go who disagree with that dating, like I do, is to say many other Jews at different times predicted the downfall of the temple, including a whole group community that lived in the time of Jesus, at Qumran, who said the temple's going to be destroyed. They cited the prophets. So we have these examples in the first century of them saying, the temple's going to fall, it's been corrupt. And Jesus is just one of several voices who said that too. So therefore, I find it very, very likely, there's a hand I found it very, very likely. Good, 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 come on. I find it very likely that Jesus, in fact, did predict the fall of the temple. Well, if that's true, then there's no more time, not stakes in the ground. Then the issue is, well, when's the latest it was written? Then you have to have other math figures, and that's why I'm not going to get bogged down in details. Um, it can't be later than the end of the first century because it's quoted by church fathers by then. Not to mention it's already in Matthew and Luke. Um, and those we can put those in sperm dates. Well, it can't be that early because it'll take a little bit of time for the stories of Jesus to transpire. And so I disagree with most New Testament scholars on this point. But I'm saying on purpose, and that is, I think Mark's gospel was written probably in the early 60s. I think it was early 60s for various reasons. Uh, to give you the Cliff's notes, I don't think it was written in the 50s. I find it most convincing that the gospel of Mark was written when the first generation of Christians were dying off. And secondly, with the influx of Gentile churches being born... I think the gospel was written to be an instruction manual, a discipleship manual for new Gentile converts. And that's why I think Mark's uh, gospel was written, as I'll say later, in Greek. Um, I don't think it's too much later, I, I, and I'll, um, for a lot of reasons. But nevertheless, so you pick up your, you can 
do what you want. Read all the commentaries. They're all going to say you're around 70 AD. You can believe that. Read the arguments if you want. That's your choice. I'm not telling you what to believe. I'm telling you, I think within a couple of decades of the life and ministry and death and resurrection of Jesus, uh, we have the Gospel of Mark written. I think you're right. My Bible says 60 to 65. 60 to 65. What, what, what Bible is that? That's got to be the, is that the, the Life Application Study Bible? Yeah, NIV. Zondervan is a, a very conservative publisher. So it's typically, well, they'll, they'll, they'll put me and people like them in one category. Oh, you're conservative. That's why you think it's early. I find that unconvincing. I don't have this view because I'm conservative. I have the view because I think historical data best demonstrates it. But that's why, yeah. Uh, life application, anything by Zondervan is going to be very conservative. And um, doesn't mean it's bad. doesn't mean it's right. I'm just saying that's, they do tend to have an earlier date. Um, Anyway, there we go. Okay. I'm going to go on quickly past it. Anything you have any questions for me about this? Questions or comments? Is this... Okay, here's where we're going to slow down. Because this part, to me, I find much more important for interpretation. Okay. What is the genre of Mark? Remember what genre means? Mm -hmm. it means? Uh, class of literature. Yeah, class of type. Uh, class of literature. Very good. Very good. So that's what genre means. Genre is uh, the French word... For type, usually we use it of a literary type or a classification of a certain literature. It's when you find a pattern of things, maybe word count, themes, tone, they fit a style. What is Mark? What is the genre of Mark? David, who gives a rip? Well, I do. And the scholarship we sure do because the very first question you should always ask when you interpret any document ever is, what is this thing? What kind of type is it? If I pick up a cookbook and read it like I do the Weather Channel, or something, I mean, that'd be what? You, you don't read a Stephen King novel, I hope you don't, like you do a Winston Churchill biography or something. They're very different things. So you want to ask the question, what am I reading? It lets me know right away how to interpret it. Um, that's how it is with Mark's Gospel. There have been three um, major responses through time, and here they are. The first major answer is Mark is a kind of ancient Greek tragedy. An ancient Greek tragedy. Now, he uses in official terms, and that's when there's a major hero who has a lot of struggles in life and ends up dying. He, he is virtuous, but he dies for the right causes, but he ends up dying. And it's a very old genre uh, for a kind of play and literature in uh Greece particularly. Notice how Jesus dies like that in Mark as well. If you know you're ending a Mark, he dies this sad, pathetic, all disciples have abandoned him. Uh, he says, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's dead, breathes his last. And a little glimpse of a resurrection implication, over. And some say that's the case. Another thing in Greek tragedy is there's almost always a big reveal of who the guy is. That's what we have in Mark chapter 8. Most scholars don't find this convincing, but it is one of, the, one of the major players of a possibility of what it is. This was a little more popular a couple generations ago, but it's still a possibility. Now, others say it's a form of a Greek novel. Oh, Dr. David? Yo! Uh, it seems when I've read Greek tragedies, oftentimes the hero reaches too far. Oh. doesn't know his boundaries, and that's what leads to his downfall. Hero so, looks, reaches too far, and that's his downfall. And so if this is a Greek tragedy, I wonder if it's trying to express... That sort of moral. Maybe. Story. Well, if you if you made the argument it's a Greek tragedy, that's the kind of stuff you would say. That would be counter to Christ being who he claimed to be. How could God reach too far? Oh, God. Yeah, right. Yeah, you're right. Then you'd assume the tragedy... Yeah. The, the, the tragedy usually plays on human limitations. Mm -hmm. Somebody tried to ascend to the level of the gods, and he just wasn't quite virtuous. Right, a guy who ascends the level of the gods. I think they would typically say is... Um, right, but if it is Greek tragedy, it is a rel If that's what it is, if that's the genre, that's how we should read it, which means we should not read Mark as presenting Jesus as some God figure. Right. Right, because that genre dictates the, the, the end of it. That is to say, Mark yeah, deliberately yeah. wrote a story of Jesus to demonstrate what happens, who did the right thing, but you're going to die for the right causes. Yeah. Yeah. It fooled himself. Yeah, and that's possible, uh, but I don't think so, so I'll just to save time. That is, is possible. Others say it's a form of a Greek novel. There's Greek problems with that one as well. It's a possibility. Or a recent one, not too long ago, was they said, well, no, it's not Greek. It's a Jewish novel. Um, that's J.W. 
Uh, that's possible, probably not. Most time, novels in the ancient world has at the core a romance. It's usually a love story. And this one's not. Can you pick one and pick one in any of the Gospels? No, they didn't fall off. Mary Magdalene, no, that stuff happens. That's good for other fiction novels that, that sell books, but they don't, they're not true. Uh, but this is possible. The most, the case that's won the day <coughs> amongst New Testament specialists and historians is um, it's a Greco-Roman a Greco-Roman bios. They would say bios. We'll get a word uh, biography from that. And it mostly fits this category. Ancient Greco-Roman biographies had certain word counts. The main uh, protagonist had so many verbs associated with them. There's ways to tell. The problem with this is the ancient bios in Greco-Roman world had a wide spectrum. I mean, just just super wide spectrum. You can have some biographies that were written of ancient characters, some written in recent death. Some were very technical, some were a little more loosey-goosey. Um, it just depended. And so a lot of scholars have been right to do this, but very nuanced. So wait a second. It probably is an ancient Greco-Roman biography, but he's, he's somewhat reinventing the will, even by moving the biography. And there's one guy who's, whose arguments really won the day, and it's Richard Burge. But um, my professor, one of my professors, really helped change the tie to make this argument. And another guy, Richard Burge, wrote another big fat loss of volume, and that really won the day of most New Testament uh, specialists. But it's probably the ancient. So what's a good way to translate bios? What's a good word? Life. A life of so-and-so, a life of so-and-so. You can read Plutarch, has tons of these things. So if this is true, and I do think it is, that uh, Mark's gospel is probably best understood as a life. A life. So if you say gospel, Mark's uh, text is a life of Jesus. A life of Jesus. Now, notice so far I haven't called this much, on purpose, the Gospel of Mark. I told you the titles, but I have not called it that. The Gospel of Mark. Now, why not? Why haven't I? Tell me why. I'm not saying... You can, but I'm, I've waited on purpose. Why do you think? Why do why have I not called it the Gospel of Mark? Look back at your text. Because it never calls itself that. It never calls itself. Where do we get this idea? It's called the gospel of something. Chapter 1, verse 1. This changed history. It says this. It looked me right? So in Greek, in, in the beginning, uh, there you go. The good news, and the word we use for through Old English, whatever, is gospel. The good news of Jesus Christ, Son of God. And that good news of Jesus Christ, or gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, that's where that comes from. For a long time, it was common in scholarship to say Mark is a unique genre in the history of the world. But that, in, and now it's, no, 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 it's, it's not unique. It's a kind of life. But that life uh, fits within some of these categories. It, it's, it's a slice in there somewhere. Well, David, that's great. It's called a life. So what? Well, it really does matter. And I'm about to tell you why. If you were in my Matthew study, some of this is repeat. And if you don't remember, it's even better you hear it again, Tom. Okay. Uh, before I tell you why this matters, why it's probably a life and how it helps us interpret it more. But before I do that, any questions so far? About DNA so far? All right. So here's why this matters. We're done with that part. This is what I do hope you'll perk up on. If it is a life of Jesus... It means several things. It, it tells how to read it. Let this sink in in common sense. If I said, Mark is a cookbook, so what? Well, that matters a lot. 350 degrees isn't a metaphor. <laughs> quarter cup of flour is an analogy. It means a quarter You read it a certain way. It does matter what kind of type it is. If Mark is a kind of ancient literary narrative called life, whoa, that gives me parameters. It gives me a lens through which to read it. It gives me certain questions I should be asking of the text. Instead of how to bake a cake, I should be asking different questions. And these are some key features of an ancient life that matter a lot. Number one, number one, it means it has, in general, a broad audience in mind. A broad audience. 
Now, here specifically, it would be a Christian audience, and it's a Christian community. Lives were meant for communities. It formed communities. Most scholars say absolutely amen, and that we should read Mark not as some dispassionate historical document, but as a deliberately crafted theological document narrative meant for a Christian community. I find that very convincing. And what kind of community is it? Well, some things we can imply from the text. What is the original language of Mark's gospel? It's not English. It was in Greek. So we know right off the bat, the Christian community speaks Greek. To prove the point even further, whenever in Mark's gospel there is an Aramaic phrase like Eloi, Eloi, Lama Sabachthani, he always has to translate it. He even translates Abba in Mark 14. He says Abba, Father. In Greek it's Abba, Pater. Aramaic and Greek, side by side. They don't even know the word Father. They don't know Aramaic. Uh, he tells a little girl, Talamathakum. Right? The little girl say, get up and rise. You know that expression? Uh, Syrophoenician. There's all kinds of things. There's Latinisms. I'll get that in a second. But there's, they know Greek. When he cites from the Old Testament, he cites from the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Called the Septuagint. Septuagint. And that's the co LXX is short for 70. That's Tradition is there were 70 translators, but probably not. Um, it's a Greek translation of the Old Testament, which means the community that heard this, some of them knew their Bible. They knew their Old Testament. That's their Bible, what we call Old Testament. But they knew it in Greek. It's a Greek community. This is not a community in downtown Jerusalem, primarily Aramaic speaking. It's not a community in downtown Galilee where Jesus preached and taught. Right off the bat, I know that this is probably a community outside of the motherland. Now, in the motherland, Israel, they spoke some Greek, but it wasn't their native tongue, as far as we can tell, except for the very educated people in Jerusalem. So right off the bat, it tells me that. There are also certain Latinisms, little Latin expressions that we find in the text. A Latinism. And that's where you take a Latin word or expression, and it's transliterated, or it's just kept in Latin. Um, sometimes the leaders are called Latin words. And as we go through the text, I'll point those out. Mm -hmm. But why do a Latinism? Probably because these are Western Greek-speaking Christians, not Eastern. That's all Greek all the time. It's, uh, it's um, what we call today Turkey. But it's probably a Western side of the Roman world, which is more like Italy, uh, Alexandria, the north part of Egypt. And then... Um, Church tradition places this in Rome. We don't know for sure. Uh, but most find it the best option. It fits all the options. Um, we're not sure. So anyway, so it is a form of community. It's a broad audience. So it's not a letter. It's meant to help a community grow up. The second thing I'd say about the genre of, um, of bios or life is it is a type of history. It is a type of history. It is not a fairy tale. It's not a fable. It's not a historical novel. It's not a romance. It's a type of history, which means when they wrote lives of the ancient people, life of Caesar, life of whomever, they're writing about actual characters who lived in the space-time continuum. This is very common among skeptics and atheists. I hear this often. Okay, let me ask you a question. So if I studied the Lord of the Rings for 30 years and told you that... Let me ask you a question. If I read Harry Potter and got 13 PhDs, would you think it's real? That demonstrates, of course, a profound ignorance of any kind of historical study. Middle Earth in Tolkien's world never existed. Harry Potter is deliberately fictional. Even if we didn't know who the author was, even if the authors didn't say, this is made up, we could examine the document and go, there is no correlation between Middle Earth and Sauron and a ring and hobbits anywhere on the planet. No archaeological evidence. Or Harry Potter, I don't know that one. Anyway, witches anyway. But the Gospels are very, very different. We can locate these things. Yes. It's a kind of history. What most Christians do is, and I use that word, they park up and go, see, every single word in there happened just as it says. I won't go there just yet. But it is a type of history, and that's really important. Other thing is, all lives 
focus on the protagonist. Remember your English days? Protagonist is the main character. The main character. There's always a main protagonist, a main person. Almost always it's a man. The gospel fits that perfectly. Who is the protagonist? It is Jesus, absolutely. You can say that in church, right? And the point of emphasizing the protagonist in life is to bring out or exemplify the character of the protagonist. And by character, you know, the personality, the, the, the metal, the, their virtues. So you tell stories in this life to really emphasize how awesome they are. But I want to say, Spencer and Tasha are so hardworking. I could say a whole bunch of things about their individual lives, where they grew up, da 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 But if I want to emphasize how hardworking they are, I want to bring out those stories and emphasize that. So by the end of the whole narrative, man, boy, they're hardworking people. I'll tell you what. Well, there's more to them than that. Well, that's true, but I'm the author, and I want to emphasize how hardworking they are. It's exactly like it is with the Gospels. They are trying to emphasize very particular things about Jesus. And we don't know anything else. Because they didn't tell us. And so when Matthew gives a little bit of hint of something different, we go, all right, it's a little something other shade. Luke, okay, a little another more shade. John, ooh, that's a very different shade. I'm the bread of life. You speak like that. You don't talk like that at all, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. These are very different shades. But even then, those four Gospels, that's all we got. We don't have 20 Gospels. Now, it's still awesome we got four. <laughs> My point is, we're just it's deliberately limited to what they want to bring out in the protagonist. It also means we interpret the Gospels. If you say, for example, the disciples go, who is this guy? Who is this guy? Remember in Mark, he calms the, 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 the waves, the storms, that Mark 5. He, he listens, even the winds obey him. And that's when the preacher goes, oh, dim-witted disciples. They don't have enough faith at all. No, 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 no. And a life is not about the disciples. It's about the protagonists. It's not about how dim-witted they are. It's about how hard you understand Jesus is. It's about how Jesus breaks the molds of our understanding. It's how Jesus is the new wine and the old wineskins. You see the difference. David, can we never talk about the disciples? Yeah, we can. They're, just, they're not the point. They're just not the point. Not, not in a life, it's not. The protagonist, and it should always, every sermon, every lesson, you should hear more about the main character than the peripheral characters. Period. So that's why I will never do a sermon series on Peter and his leadership skills. Who gives a rip? I love Peter. I'll see him. I'll love him. I'll give him a hug when I see him. Hug and kiss. But Pete, you're not the point. I care about Jesus. And your interaction with him tells me about Jesus. Maybe some about you, but you're not the point. It's like all of us, right? We're not the point. He's the point. Uh, another thing about life is that there's a loose chronology. Loose. That's my term. Meaning... <laughs> it's history, but they have no problem bending those dates, changing things around. They have no problem. That is very problematic for us Westerners with print and plagiarism and whatever. We don't like all that. We want to be, and this happened, and this happened, this happened. They do not have that problem. They are taught in school to be free with chronology. Why would they do that? Because they're writing a life and they're trying to talk about the protagonist and his characteristics. Mark, Matthew, and Luke have Jesus overturning the under changer's table, the beginning or end of his life. At the very end of his life, right? He goes to the temple at the very end. That's the thing that gets him in trouble. It gets him arrested. It gets him a big deal. It's not the thing. It leads to the tumult. In John's gospel, when does that happen? First thing. John's gospel does that on purpose almost certainly, because John's trying to demonstrate throughout his gospel that when you see Jesus, you see a walking temple. Temple has been judged immediately. Jesus is the word made flesh. He's the walking tabernacle. It says that in John 1, he tabernacled, he became flesh and dwelt among us. Almost, now some Christians, a lot, say, no, no, it happened twice. Beginning of his ministry and end of his ministry. Maybe that really might have happened. I don't find that convincing. I think John took the thing that happened at the end and put the very beginning. I think it makes the most sense of what John was trying to get at. But if you don't like that, if you want it to be lined up perfectly, then you have to say it happened twice and other things like that. Uh, there's tons of examples of that. But they had no problem. It's our problem, not theirs. They didn't ask my opinion. 
frankly, if that's my opinion, I wish they would not have done that. I'd say, I hear your point about the character, Mark, but brother, just start at the top. Where was he born? Then not know the dog's name? Just go. For, I want to hear every detail you're going to know, but he didn't ask my opinion, and when we get there, we'll know. There is a loose, quote unquote, quote unquote, narrative, but, but more strict, quote unquote, stricter, dialogue. Dialogue. A more loose narrative, a more strict dialogue. They don't have a problem paraphrasing, expanding, deflating the narrative. They have more of a problem messing with the, dot, the words Jesus says. In Matthew and in Luke, it's the exact same thing. You'll find more differences in the narrative of surrounding details, countryside, green grass, blue sky, whatever. When Jesus starts talking, there's much more strict. And there's a whole scholarship on the whole issue, but I'm just sparing, sparing so much time. A little more loose narrative. This is what lives do. That's what lives do. And then the last thing, probably, on this, which is, even if it were secular, even if a pagan did it, a Greek or Greco-Roman person did it, they're still deliberately biased. And Mark sure is. He's theologically motivated. Theologically motivated. He cares a lot about God and God's kingdom. He is deliberately preachy. He is not writing a dispassionate news report. Today in news, at 7 o'clock, thunder. He doesn't do that. He doesn't want to write that. He's writing it for a community. More specifically, Mark sees Jesus' life, death, teaching, and resurrection through one particular Old Testament prophet who really flavors, skews, colors, how Mark sees the whole show. They said, Deborah, just tell me about your childhood, but just in a nutshell, what was it like? Say, Disney World. Walt Disney. All right, you just, Donald Trump, baby. I mean, it tells a lot, but say those words. It evokes images. Mark's favorite prophet is, you might know? I'm going to guess Isaiah. Isaiah. Isaiah, absolutely. Mark absolutely sees Jesus as an Isaiah kind of figure. He quotes and alludes to Isaiah more than any other prophet or biblical text by far. He has he loves apparently seeing Jesus as the suffering servant of Isaiah 51 and 53, who takes upon the sins of himself upon the world, and so forth. His emphasis upon the kingdom of God bursting in and the, the sight the blind can see and so that's that's Isaiah through and through. Isaiah through and through. I'm going to pause right there and I'll let this simmer in because you're doing great on time. I'm going to pause there. Any, anything at all? Any questions or comments at all on anything? You haven't commented much on the author's identity. That, thank you. That's, that's my very next note. Okay, okay, thank you. Good. Very good. Yeah. Okay. The, the author's identity. I, I'm going to tell you what I think about that. Very good. Okay. Very good. Is there anything else on this? Or whatever? Very good. Can you see? I'm trying to get out of the way. I can say right here. Thank you. Anything? Okay. Everything I've said about the genre of life fits Matthew and Luke as well. Mm -hmm. John probably. But take this knowledge and apply it to Matthew and Luke as well. Keep asking, and John, keep asking, what's this time about Jesus? Theologically motivated and so forth. If you get really caught up on historical minutia and trying to make sure it fits exactly my humble opinion, you're misreading the text. Keep asking questions. What does it tell me about Jesus? What does it tell me about um, his character and so forth? Okay. Let's go ahead. As I alluded to when I first started, if you look at the top part of your gospel, it says the, according to Mark. That's not what the manuscripts say. That's what we say. Why do we say it's the gospel or the life of Mark? Well, unfortunately, in my opinion, the earliest evidence we have that it was written by Mark comes many decades after probably when this was composed by various early church fathers. And to save time, I was going to type this out. I'll just give you a copy of it. So if you look on the handout I gave you, told us page two, it says start here in a big fat arrow. 
You see that? Yeah, your hand out there. Uh, this is from Ben Witherington. These are standard places, but you see that says start here? A variety of sources dating ultimately to the second century AD uh, univocally indicate that this gospel was written by a person named Mark who was the associate of Peter. I'm going to come back to that in a second. The testimony of Irenaeus and against heresies is as follows. After there, that's Peter and Paul's departure, and that might mean death. Mark, the disciple, and Hermanutis of Peter, that's it's probably means uh, the reason why he puts keeps that as it is in, um, in Greek is because it can be, it's, a, it's debated in scholarship. It could mean messenger, it can mean translator. I, I do think it's translator. The disciple and translator of Peter, or interpreter of Paul, of Peter, transmitted his preaching to us in written form. But that's, the, that's an iron ass. That's early, early on. Another document, it's called the anti martianite Prologue to Mark's Gospel. It's a different, I underline it, it's a separate document. It says, Mark asserted, the one who was called stump-fingered because he had short fingers in comparison with the size of the rest of his body. Did you know that? We don't know if that's what it really is. That's just, again, that's what's written. How much this is true, we don't know. But uh, he, was, <laughs> he was Peter interpress, interpress. So that's uh, there in Latin, maybe interpreter. After the death of Peter himself, Mark wrote down this gospel in some part of Italy. That's an early document. And then a quotation from late in the second century, that's late 100s, by Clement of Alexandria says that Mark wrote in Rome during Peter's lifetime, but this is the only sign in the later work of Eusebius. Eusebius, uh, you see that word E U S E B I S Eusebius? That's he's our, our probably most valuable early church historian. Now Eusebius himself can be theologically motivated, so we always have to take what he says with a grain of salt. Uh, but he quotes a lot from people who lived before him. I can't tell you how sad it is how many documents from the early church we don't possess. They're completely gone from history. Completely gone from history. It's so depressing. How many stuff was burned up in libraries and destroyed by the Romans? And I mean, just it's depressing to me. It's it's amazing. So people like Eusebius are they're literally priceless because they quote from authors that we would not know existed if he didn't quote from them. And we go, oh, like the next quote. And this is so important. That is from Papias. Papias is uh, well. Let me just read it. That's better. I want to cite it. Um, Papias source comes from the fourth century where you see. So about around 325, Eusebius wrote this called the History of the Church. That's the English translation. But Eusebius is in turn quoting Papias' second century five volume work uh, translated Interpretation of the Lord's Sayings, a document which dates about 120 to 130. Let me pause here for a second. So that means Eusebius, the church historian, is quoting from, supposedly, a five volume work of Papias who lived. Probably around the 120s AD. We don't have any of it. We don't have any of Papias' original five volumes. Oh, God, wish we did. All we have is what Eusebius said he said. So we don't know if he's lying, if he's mistaken, if he's telling the truth. Most New Testament, most scholars said we think he's probably got it right. Um, but that's what we have. All we have is that. But this, if this is true, 120, that means within the second generation of Christians who existed, basically, second, third generation. That means... Papias, and the legend is, um, Papias was John the Elder's disciple. The John the Elder, who wrote 1, 2, 3 John, and probably Revelation, maybe. But his disciple was Papias. And so this guy knows people. <laughs> he knows peeps. And this is, one of, this is the most ancient um, evidence we have that Mark comes from the John Mark that we think it might be. And this is a good translation with some transliteration stuck in there. And this is what the elder said. That's John the elder. Mark, who became Peter's probably translator, interpreter, accurately wrote, though not in order, as many of the things said and done by the Lord as he had noted, made mention of, made, written down or uh, made note on. For he neither heard the Lord nor followed him. That is John Mark. But afterwards, as I said, followed Peter, who composed his teaching according to the Kraia. I'll do that in a second. And not as a rhetorical arrangement of the Lord's sayings. So Mark made no mistake in writing some things just as he recollected them. For he was careful of this one thing, to leave nothing he heard out and to say nothing falsely. Now, uh, there's some technical difficulties with it. But those who are very skeptical of this claim, like a Bart Ehrman and many others say, of course Eusebius quotes, quotes Papias to say that. Of course he does. Because when Eusebius... And Irenaeus before him, the quote from the page before, 
Irenaeus and Eusebius, they're doing it to prove their point because they're under attack by people they call heretics. And they have a different gospel. And so to make them sound so awesome as their gospel, my gospel comes from Pete himself. It comes from Peter. And they say he made all it up. So the author himself is making all this up. That's the most skeptical version of the argument. Dismiss all of it. It was made up to make sure they thought that they had their true gospel. Most scholars don't go that route. Most scholars say, I don't think it's that convincing. I think I'll listen to it very carefully and see what he says. And it matches very clearly these other documents, uh, as I've already just noted. If it's true, and we don't know for sure, people, we don't know for sure. If it's true what he said, it means that Pavia says that he received a tradition that the origin of the material in the Gospel of Mark chiefly comes from Peter himself. And that Mark was Peter's hermeneutis, maybe interpreter. Uh, so the idea would go is that Peter, who primarily spoke in Aramaic, he's from Palestine, Remember the book of Acts, if that's true too historically, Peter is commissioned to be a missionary to the Jews in diaspora, was your Greek-speaking Jews. So if this is true, it fits Acts nicely, and some skeptics say too nicely. Well, unless it's true. If it's true, it means what we have here is Peter is literally doing exactly what it says in Acts, which is he's commissioned out to these Greek-speaking Jews who don't live in Palestine. He goes away from home. He goes to Canada from here, and they speak a different language called Greek. But Peter doesn't speak Greek very well. He speaks Aramaic. So someone's got to interpret for him. And who does that? John Mark. Jonas Marcus. John Mark, who's related to Barnabas, who would have received a high education in Jerusalem, some wealth, and because he's wealthy, he would have received an education to speak and read Greek. And that's what Papius is saying. And then over time, as Peter's interpreter... He collects a large portion of material that he repeated from place to place to place to place. These kraea, that's that C-H-R-E-Y, uh, right toward the top. Is that where it was? Yeah, middle, of the middle of the paragraph. Right in the middle of the paragraph, kraea. Kraea is a technical, <coughs> it's a technical grammatical term used in this time period for any saying of someone. And these kraea, when you went to school, Linda, if you learned Greek when you were in school back then, you had a textbook and a few favorite textbooks. They were called Progonosmata. These Greek grammars taught you how to read Greek, how to write Greek. They taught you all kinds of stuff. They taught you how to write Kraia. And you would have exercises to practice your Greek spelling and how to do the literature. One exercise is to take a saying from an ancient person like Caesar. Take that saying and decrease it. Shrink it down. Give us the nuts and bolts. Another exercise would take that thing and say, now expand it. Based on what you know about Caesar, fill in the blanks. They would do these exercises on purpose to learn how to do Greek. Does that make sense? That's what Kraya is. So what Papius, Eusebius is saying, Papius is saying, <laughs> that Peter did not go in chronological order. He didn't need to. Because they're Kraya. He took the sayings he received from Peter, basically, and put them in a narrative framework that he wanted. And that's where it comes from. So in church tradition, this is the dominant view. Historically speaking, I find this by far the most convincing of the evidence. Yeah. I do. Uh, and there's more to it, but anyway, this is it. Uh, you have now seen the primary evidence. You haven't seen the scholarship much, but this is the primary. You have read for yourself with your own eyes, English translations, of the earliest known um, attribution of this gospel with Mark. Whether they're all lying or mistaken, we don't really know, but I don't think so. I think this is the best evidence. If that's the case, it means, well, who is this? It means it's John Mark. So look in Acts 12, 25. If you have your Bible, Acts 12, 25. We're going to skip around real quickly to a few verses I want you to see for yourself. Acts 12, 25. Remember, Acts is the book that tells about how the gospel's Going everywhere with Apostle Paul. Acts 12, 25. After the, after the gospel spread and spread, it says, And Barnabas and Shaul, or Paul, saw Paul, same person, returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their mission, bringing with them Jonas, that's John, whose other name was 
Marcon. Yeah, Ioannis is Greek. Marcon is or Marcus. Marcus from the Latin spelling. So he's a Greek-speaking Jew. And that's why I gave him the other name. Just like Shaul, Saul, his other name is? Paul. Paul, that's right. It was always Saul. It was always Paul, baby, all the time. Go to Colossians 4. Colossians. Way back on the other side, the right side of the Colossians 4. Paul's right to this church of Colossae. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you. He's in jail. And Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. Concerning who you have received instructions, if he comes, do you receive him? And then a guy named he, he, Jesus, or Jesus, who's called Eustus. They gave him his nickname. You don't call him Jesus. Uh, uh, Mark's a cousin of Barnabas. We know that Barnabas was a fairly wealthy guy because he was able to sell land in the book of Acts to give it to the apostles. You didn't sell land unless you were wealthy. And so almost certainly he grew up in Jerusalem. That's where he sold the land from. Where he would have received a good education, almost certainly. Go to 2 Timothy 4 11. 2 Timothy 4 11. So keep going to your right side of the Bible. 2 Timothy 4 11. We see once again that Paul's serving with this mark. 2 Timothy 4 11. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful in serving me. And keep going all the way. And the last one 1 Peter 5 13. 1 Peter. 5.13. First Peter 5.13. She who is in Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings. And so does my son, Mark. Well, everyone thinks that's not his literal son, of course, but his son in the faith. So these are references we see that the, the John Mark of the New Testament was a companion of Paul in his missionary work. And if that's true, based on that and some other timing issues, John Mark would have been younger than all of them. And because of that, I'm a, well, we'll get there in the Mark's text. Uh, many people think Mark himself wrote himself into the story of the Gospel of Mark. <laughs> in one very particular spot. Remember what it was? I think so. When Jesus gets arrested in the garden, yeah. they all flee. And then it says, and one of the guards mm -hmm. grabbed a guy with a white tunic and ripped off the clothes and got bolted off naked. <laughs> Who in the world is that dude? It's just this unnamed disciple who never came in the story and never gets out. He just there he is streaking out Gethsemane like a college. A lot of people think, we can't prove it, that was Mark himself. But we're not sure. It makes some sense because that was in Jerusalem where John Mark probably grew up, educated. And John Mark might have come in contact with Jesus a little bit. Um, but he himself was not a disciple of Jesus. Probably, like even Papias says here. He was not um, so if you say Mark's gospel is not John Mark, and all these early church fathers made this stuff up, that's you're hard-pressed to figure out why would they do that. Mark is not a disciple of Jesus. He's not an apostle. He's not a big name in the early church. I just read to you almost every reference there is in the New Testament. He's not a big player. And all of a sudden, a whole gospel is attributed to him throughout the literature. It makes a lot more sense if people were skeptical to say Matthew's... He didn't write that. He's an apostle. He would have been a Jew. And Luke, oh, that's just to prove your point. But why Mark? And it's because, almost certainly, because Mark so early on was associated with whom? Peter. With Peter. Yeah, Mark was associated with Big Pete. And church tradition puts him in Rome, that Peter did missionary work with Greek-speaking Jews, and he did interpreter. And later on, even archaeological tradition puts him in the city of Rome. So, to answer your question, who, I haven't said about the author. Who is the author of Mark? We do not know. We do not know because Mark, Mark's text does not tell us. And that's also, by the way, kind of weird. In Greco-Roman lives, they did almost always. But when Jews wrote stories about God's work, they didn't usually do it. But it's still a little weird. It doesn't tell us. All we have is external things that start pointing and pointing and pointing. And then by the second, third century, everybody thinks it's John Mark. And that's what wins the day. He's never, it's never debated. It's always, oh, that's Mark's gospel. Now, why did all of a sudden they start naming according to Mark, according to Matthew, according to Luke? Um, if you're very skeptical, you say because they just made stuff up. If you're not so skeptical, and that happens, people make, say that kind of stuff. If you're not so skeptical, and I find this very convincing, the reason why in the second century and third century is the first time they finally start saying it, it's because of what was happening in the church. There were other people 
writing other Gospels, and especially the group of people called the Gnostics. I'm not going to go much into that right now. And also an early church father named Tatian. Tatian wrote a thing called the Diatessaron, which was his harmony of all four Gospels. And early church fathers were having all kinds of people writing different biblical books, quote-unquote biblical books written by supposed bishops and apostles and disciples, all kinds of fake letters by Paul, fake documents by Peter himself. And so these early church fathers almost certainly had a scurry and say, no, we have the ones that come from the first century. The one according to Mark, the one according to Matthew, the one according to Luke, according to John. And any other gospel you hear, there's one called the Gospel of Peter, all kinds of them, Gospel of Mary, those things they would say are false, they're not true. And so it probably was what we would later call a heresy or conflict in the church that forced these people to go, okay, we got to be clear about this real quickly. We haven't been talking about but now we got to be real clear and put it in print. And that seems to be why they started saying, we know it's John Mark. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. I really do hope that you enjoyed it. I hope you'll listen more. If you want more, go to davidpendergrass.com. There are tabs at the top that let you have access to all the podcasts I've recorded, to sermons I've done, uh, books I've written. They're all there at davidpendergrass.com. You can also check me out on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash glimpse of the kingdom facebook.com forward slash glimpse of the kingdom and also look at my twitter feed at glimpse the king or at dr d pendergrass at dr d pendergrass there's tons of ways reached out i hope you will send me your questions send me your comments if you'd like to support the ministries of glimpse of the kingdom you can also find ways to give online on davidpendergrass.com if you'd like for me to come and do some consulting check out my website davidpendergrassconsulting.com And I'll be happy to come out and speak to your organization and help and train any way I can. God bless you. See you online.